Okay, so um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this uh, important panel session on digital divides and digital inclusion. Um, my name is Paul Donahoe. Uh, I'm from the Universal Postal Union, from the UPU, and I have the, the pleasure of uh, introducing this uh, discussion today. Um, we are joined by uh, a distinguished group of speakers from a variety of regions and backgrounds uh, from around the world who will all share with us some valuable insights uh, on this critical topic for digital inclusion and the digital divide. Um, I'm also uh, joined um, today in, in co-moderating this with uh, my colleague uh, Tracy Hackshaw. Uh, so Tracy, introduce yourself please. Thank you, Paul, and welcome, and good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. Um, I, as Paul said, my name is Tracy Hackshaw. I'm also with the Universal Postal Union, the UPU, and I am responsible for the Dot Post Initiative, um, which is a secure, trusted, top-level domain for the postal sector. And we are looking to um, give you some great information um, about what we do and what we plan to do and have um, hear, hear from you as well about what you'd like us to do for you. So welcome and um, let's have some good discussion this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, and yes, um, together uh, we aim to ensure that this session is uh, interactive, engaging and informative uh, for both our online and offline participants, the people in the room here today. We're joined by uh, a number of people online from around the world as well, which is great to see. Uh, we also have an online moderator um, who's joining us for, from Switzerland. Uh, he has got up early this morning. Uh, Juan Moroni, uh, who is a digital inclusion, digital transformation uh, expert uh, from the UPU in Switzerland as well. So good morning, Juan. Juan is chatting. He's, Aha, he's okay. using the chat, yes. Super. Um, which is great because uh, that is um, a, a good way to highlight uh, the interactive nature of this session. Um, Juan will be uh, monitoring the, uh, the online chat uh, and ensuring that um, all participants have the opportunity to ask questions and, and share their thoughts. Uh, and so Juan will be um, taking that uh, focus and we will come back to you, Juan, uh, during the session. Um, to, to see how the online discussion is going. So, um, before we dive into um, the discussion today, I'd like to introduce uh, our esteemed panel of speakers. Uh, each of them brings a, a unique perspective uh, to the table. Um, first of all, uh, on my right, um, Mr. Rodney Taylor, who is the Secretary General of the Caribbean uh, Te Telecommunications Union. Uh, Rodney will be well known to, to many of you. Uh, with his uh, activities in uh, the IGF, so welcome Rodney. And we're also joined by Mr. Talan Sultanov, uh, the co-founder and board member of uh, the Internet Society in the Kyrgyz chapter. Um, so welcome Talan, uh, and we're uh, honoured to have uh, your participation in the, the discussion today. Um, what we uh, really want to do is have this to be a, an interactive and informative session, as, uh, as Tracy mentioned. So our discussion today revolves around the transformative potential of the postal sector in fostering digital inclusion, um, particularly looking at um, the digital divide that still exists in many communities and, and in the underserved communities where there are um, citizens uh, and small businesses that are still disconnected, uh, missing out on this fabulous opportunity that the digital economy is bringing. Um, we have been uh, almost uh, 20 years since the initial discussions on the information society uh, began in, in Tunis. And um, today, still, there is this significant divide, uh, particularly in rural and remote communities and underserved parts of the population are still missing out on, on, on these um, benefits that we all um, take for granted, uh, particularly in uh, major capital cities uh, and in developed countries around the world. So with our panelists today, we want to explore this topic, uh, share experiences, 
understand some of the challenges uh, and where um, there can be solutions um, uh, and uh, examples of solutions that uh, have helped bring these disadvantaged uh, and underserved communities into uh, the digital economy. And particularly considering um, that there is this uh, new um, uh, ongoing discussion within the, the GDC uh, and within the, the WISIS around meaningful connectivity and what does meaningful connectivity really mean um, uh, in this uh, area, particularly serving underserved communities. Then we hope to, to explore a number of different uh, possibilities and a number of different examples in, in that area today. Um, so before we um, get into the first session, I'll, I'll just give a bit of a, a highlight of um, the role that the poster sector, postal sector plays uh, in um, the, the digital economy. So I'll pull up some, some slides. If I can use the technology trophy. <laughs> Yes, and we can see it online. Yes, Super. perfect. Thank you. So, yeah, the title of this session today is uh, the Postal Network as a Vehicle for, for Digital Inclusion. And as I mentioned, um, the Postal Network uh, is a, a network that exists in over 650,000 locations around the world. And most communities in the world have access to postal, uh, post office and postal services. There are uh, millions of employees within the postal network as well that have daily contact with people. Uh, and I think that uh, this is an important element about ensuring digital inclusion. It's not just about the technology. It's not just about the connectivity. It's also about the human touch. Uh, particularly in underserved communities and in the underprivileged um, parts of society. And um, this uh, week, actually on Monday of this week, was World Post Day. And um, uh, we celebrated that around the world. Uh, and the UN Secretary General's message on World Post Day, I think, is very telling and very relevant for, for our discussions this week. Um, where he says that the postal system has long served as a cornerstone of connectivity across the globe. Uh, and that has been for thousands of years. Um, and in today's digital world, that fundamental role remains key. Uh, the postal network is immense and extends to many of the remotest communities. And we can maximize its reach to help boost digital inclusion and drive progress on the sustainable development goals particularly. The theme of this year's World Post Day, Together for Trust, calls on governments, the private sector and development partners to do exactly that. And uh, we were very um, uh, honoured to have the UN Secretary General also recognise um, the UPU for its leadership in the new Connect.Post initiative which aims to ensure that every post office has sufficient access to the internet by 2030. The, the concept of this project is um, connect a post, connect a community, uh, and connect the people in that community and connect the businesses in that community to benefit from the, the digital um, society. Now this comes from, uh, all the way back as I mentioned, uh, in WISIS. Um, the WISIS um, outcome documents, the, the Declaration of Principles, the G Geneva Plan of Action, the Tunis Agenda, recognise that the postal network has an important um, role to play and is an important infrastructure for the information economy. And there was a number of references in those outcome doc documents to encourage governments and other stakeholders to establish sustainable um, community access centres uh, in post offices, um, to design st specific training programs in the use of ICTs, um, to educate uh, the postal workers uh, and help postal workers educate the communities that they serve um, in ICTs. And then also um, to affirm the commitment to build ICT capacities to improve access and use of postal networks and services. So these are all extract references from the, the WISIS um, Declaration Plan of Action and the Tunis Agenda. So this discussion has been uh, a long discussion um, over the last 20 years, but still 
um, today, we see that of the 650,000 post offices that, that are located in communities around the world, there are still a significant number of post offices that are not connected. Uh, and so um, that's a, a strong message that we want to bring out of this uh, panel session is the, the call to action to, to governments to continue to integrate the, the post into their um, digital plans uh, and consider uh, the important role that the post plays in facilitating the connection between the people and businesses and the digital economy. Um, and so we hope in this uh, session today to explore a number of uh, ideas and options around that um, uh, and, uh, and to see where um, this can go for, uh, for the coming um, de decade of action uh, towards 2030. Um, before, I, um, before I hand over to our, to our panel, I, I also just want to reflect um, on some strong learnings that we've had uh, in the last few years due to the pandemic. The pandemic has really um, accelerated a, a number of uh, initiatives uh, and, and no more than also in the postal uh, network. The postal network was binding societies um, during the pandemic. Um, it was servicing um, uh, the citizens uh, and the small businesses it was one of the public infrastructures that was uh, strengthened uh, during the pandemic to deliver a variety of services to the people uh, who were locked away, isolated due to the restrictions of the pandemic. Post offices were delivering government aid um, to communities through financial aid. There was also postal network was used to deliver physical uh, medical supplies um, to, to communities so that they could um, uh, be protected against this uh, terrible pandemic. Postal workers continued um, to service the communities during the pandemic as they do during war um, and, uh, and conflict uh, areas as well. Uh, and so this uh, was reinforced during the pandemic as, as the post was uh, delivering services and distributing um, government aid and uh, taking part in digital transformation uh, initiatives, uh, including working with, um, with other government agencies to deliver government services, digital government services, digital financial services to the communities. And again, we're talking about really the reach out into the underserved communities as well, which is where the real value of, uh, of these services um, can exist. And also supporting small and medium enterprises um, who uh, were very hardly, uh, very much affected by the pandemic in terms of their ability to trade. Um, people were locked down, so they weren't having access through uh, traditional physical markets. And so many SMEs transitioned to um, digital companies. Uh, and the post was there to facilitate that transition to digital companies. Uh, and acted as a, a hub for exchange of goods uh, and financial services for SMEs so that they could continue to trade online. And, and I think we'll hear about um, some of those opportunities in today's panel as well. So I, um, uh, I will now um, hand over to, to Tracy, my co-moderator, um, who can help uh, facilitate the, the discussion during the panel uh, as we go through the variety of um, experts that we have. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for that wonderful introduction and that historical background. I think it gives us good context for today's session. Um, so as we move through the, the, the open forum, uh, and as Paul indicated, we'd like to uh, address stakeholders directly on the opportunities that are available through the postal sector, but by giving practical examples and some case studies, which is why we have assembled this particular group of experts. So I'd like to start with um, S.G. Rodney Taylor, who, uh, as um, we indicated, is, this, is the Caribbean Telecoms Union um, leader. He's had a lot of experience doing work in the Caribbean, and in particular in his home country in Barbados, especially with the post. So that's very helpful for our discussion. So I'd like to ask Rodney, um, what do you think, um, based on your experience, could be a great opportunity for the postal sector, um, especially in countries like um, the Caribbean, the Pacific, other underserved regions um, for digital inclusion. Uh, have you seen um, opportunities there? Have you experienced any particular um, 
um, you know, references that we could use and maybe give us a, an idea of what we can do to, um, based on those experiences, um, and probably improve on or, or advise others moving forward in that regard. Rodney, probably over to you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, good day, everyone. Happy to be a part of this discussion this morning um, and uh, to share my experience from a small state in Barbados, but also um, from where I sit at the regional level within CARICOM, the Caribbean community. So the internet was supposed to be the death of postal services, right? They, they, nobody was sending mail anymore. Everything was electronic mail, and therefore um, post offices would be banished from the face of the earth. <laughs> it is far from what has happened. Um, there's been, of course, the growth of e-commerce, the need to get goods <laughs> into people's hands, um, and that is only, I mean, Paul laid a good groundwork in terms of the pandemic and what happened and how posts were able to facilitate the continuation of, of public service delivery. Um, in Barbados in particular, there was uh, an initiative where the Ministry of Digital Transformation, Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology worked with the Ministry of Home Affairs, I think post fell under, falls under Home Affairs, but with the Barbados Postal Service to deliver credentials, um, in particular the driver's license, um, where you could apply to have your driver's license renewed, um, and then within 24 hours that's delivered to your home or your office. Um, that was one of the big success stories uh, because that you compare that with having to take time off from work, to go to a government office to spend an hour or two in the line, pay cash, um, and then uh, return another day to collect that license or wait, or wait. In some cases, they, they um, you, you had to wait. So all of that, the, the, the productivity gains from simply that, that simple implementation and collaboration with the Postal Service. And then that was expanded to the delivery of the passport as well. Right, and uh, of course that has now cascaded into other services. But for me, it's a no-brainer for that speci specific aspect of partnering with the government to, uh, especially the ministries of digital transformation, to support the initiatives, at the national transformation initiatives at the national level, and to make life easier for citizens. Uh, I remember once um, an Estonian told me, you know we don't know where the government offices are. We just, we don't go. <laughs> so I can't tell you where to find the ministry of, uh, you know, the, the license and authority. I don't know. <laughs> so, and that's what we want. We want to keep people out of government offices. It is simply inefficient. It is a waste of time. Uh, I've seen where, you know, there have been lines even before the, the government office opens, you know, at five in the morning, people just want to be first in the queue so they can get um, their uh, license or whatever. And, and and um, head to work. This is really not how we do things in a digital digital economy. Uh, with respect to the service bureaus, and again, this is something, a discussion that goes back uh, maybe 25 years or more where we talked about service bureaus, a one-stop shop for government. This is a, an opportunity um, to, because the post offices are in communities, that I should be able to put on my short pants, walk down the street, and interact uh, if you know if I'm, I don't have the necessary the, the skills the digital skills to interact that I can go to my friendly neighborhood post office and have someone help me uh, in Barbados already the post office helps persons with the application for US visas um, those persons who don't have a computer don't have a credit card uh, or who simply don't have the skills to do it and if you've ever had to apply for a US visa online <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it requires a degree in itself. It requires you to submit so much information. It takes at least an hour, maybe th maybe more, two hours sometimes. Um, and so you could understand the, the, the it may be daunting for some people. So if you can have that hand holding for those citizens that need that help, and that goes across the board. And um, there's I ultimately you want also that citizens don't have to, like I said, find this department and then find that other department and find a third department to simply access government services. If they can go to one lo convenient location and interact, then it makes all the sense in the world. So for me, it's a no-brainer, and it, the, the thing is to be able to get that message across and build awareness uh, the level at the policymakers so they understand that these are not two separate and distinct discussions that we're having. We're talking about how can we work together 
to support the implementation of the national digital transformation, working along with POST um, to make life easier for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ashley Taylor. And, and what you've said, I think, brings to the fore the, the possibilities that we can look at utilizing the, faci the facilities that the post offices already have, the people that are already there so that we can tap into resources that are there, as well as perhaps you know, to think bigger in terms of how we see the post office um, in our own jurisdictions, our own countries. There's, there are opportunities there, I believe, for um, new ways of doing things, doing business, new ways of connecting people, and new ways of actually ensuring that those who are not currently in the digital economy can get that first touch, that first feel. By if they don't have a PC at home or connectivity at home, Maybe there's an opportunity to use something like the post office to do that. I touched on co connectivity, which is my segue now, into my, my other colleague to my left, um, Talent from the um, Kyr <laughs> Kyrgyz chapter of the Internet Society. Um, Talent has a lot of experience in community networks, actually. And this is something that I believe is another ac aspect of the the connectivity challenge we need to look at, the connectivity meaning the broader perspective of connectivity. So when you look at the post offices, especially in you know, rural, um, far-flung areas, there could be challenges in terms of connectivity, in terms of infrastructure as a whole, electricity, et cetera. So we talk about you know, using the, these post offices as a vehicle, but if they're not connected, then you know this, this argument falls flat on its face. So Talent is here to help us understand what's actually possible given the you know, limited resources that many countries have to extend connectivity and what can be done given his experience in doing such a thing in a small state, in a landlocked state, but in a state that I think has done it successfully. And Talent, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Tracy, for the very good uh, segue into the presentation. I'll try to share my screen. and. Uh, because I prepared a couple of slides. Uh, but I don't see. Uh. Is that the first time you share your screen? I don't see it. Maybe I'm uh, not co my host, yeah? Oh, it's this one. Is it easy to do now? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. See, also I'm, uh, I work in the IT. I <laughs> still struggle every time. <laughs> yeah, the PowerPoint or the PDF. No, no video. Can we see it? Yeah? Please. Aha, excellent, yeah. Uh, and uh, Paul uh, mentioned that uh, this is going to be an interactive section se uh, session, so I tried to do it interactive as well. Uh, this is just a picture that shows uh, what is Kyrgyzstan. We just uh, heard the perspective of, of a a uh, small island uh, developing nations and uh, uh, in, in this presentation uh, I would like to show you the small uh, landlocked mountainous countries. Uh, uh, I, I think we have probably uh, similar challenges and also other kinds of challenges uh, that uh, we deal and I'm very glad. I have always wanted to meet uh, colleagues uh, in small developing island nations to learn uh, how to promote you know, uh, our countries uh, and maybe work together. So to demonstrate the situation. And when I talk about uh, interactivity, I prepared just a very small quiz. Uh, and you know, um, uh, soon there will be Christmas, if you don't celebrate Christmas, the new year, like in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, there is, uh, this is a question I would like to ask you, and if you respond correctly, I have chocolate from Central Asia. And if somebody responds uh, from online, we will send it by post. <laughs> And <laughs> we will see uh, how long it will take the chocolate to get. <laughs> <laughs> so any guesses? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a hint if you'd like. North Pole? Hmm? North Pole. North Pole? One uh, uh, option. Any other ideas? Lapland. Uh, Lapland. Good. So one, one hint, uh, it's uh, because I come from Central Asia, it's related to Central Asia. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I think. <laughs> Ah, see. Well, I think uh, we are all correct that the Santa should be living uh, in every part of the world to be able to deliver. Uh, and actually, there were scientists in, uh, I think, Norway or in Sweden, uh, where Lapland, right, is close. Uh, so it's not us saying that. And they, s they calculated that for Santa to be able to deliver all this mail uh, to all the children around the world, uh, he should be living in Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> Can you imagine? And that would allow him to get ev everywhere at the same time. And uh, it's actually uh, kind of uh, also mm, in reality, uh, the next slide also shows that uh, Central Asia, and this is the map of Eurasia, uh, was actually the center of uh, economic uh, gravity in, in the world for many centuries. And uh, of course, then uh, with the Industrial Revolution, the Information Revolution, it's shifted towards uh, Europe, to the West. And um, uh, now the economists are predicting maybe it will shift back. And I was thinking why Central Asia was able to become the center of uh, economic gravity in the world. And probably because of the, uh, f um, we had the Silk Road, ancient Silk Road, and along the Silk Road, there was a very effective uh, postal system running, uh, the ancient Pony Express. So you could get from uh, Mongolia to Europe in a very, very uh, short time, and this uh, Pony Express was considered to be one of the fastest uh, and the most extensive postal networks uh, in the world uh, at the time. Uh, and I think it inspired uh, the mm, modern postal services too. So when, when I was looking Wikipedia today, Pony Express, it doesn't talk about ancient Pony Express, it talks about Pony Express in the US. So very little uh, mention of uh, the ancient one, so I think it also uh, this, uh, shows how internet is still geared towards more Western content, and we need to work on that as well to bring more kind of uh, uh, information there. And there is a book, uh, if you have a chance, uh, maybe you would read it, uh, by Dr. Fred Starr. He lives in uh, Washington, D.C., big Central Asia scholar. And he titled his book, The Lost Enlightenment. He says, so Central Asia was the center of cultural, scientific, postal you know, experience, but at some point it all went away and what happened and can we bring it back? And that's uh, one of uh, my, I guess, uh, small goals is to uh, make uh, Central Asia again part of the global economy. And I think, uh, as uh, Rodney mentioned, you know, with the internet, uh, e-commerce, uh, all this uh, uh, becomes possible thanks to the new technologies. And uh, But of course, in Central Asia, we have major uh, challenges. Uh, we are landlocked. Uh, one of the uh, experts who is actually in the IGF today, he also coined the sanctions locked. And I add that we also brain drained. So this makes it really very difficult uh, to bring internet connectivity and to improve the postal connectivity too, because it, as you can see uh, in this map, uh, very long distances, uh, deserts, mountains. So I wouldn't uh, envy the people who work in the postal service to, uh, deliver, to be delivering goods to and from our region. And I, I, I think that digitalization could actually make lives easier. And uh, uh, the goal o of uh, our session and of this initiative is to uh, connect uh, every postal office to the internet by 2030. And this resonated very much with the uh, activity that's already uh, happening at the moment is to connect every school uh, in the world um, to the internet by 2030. It's an uh, initiative by ITU and UNICEF called GIGA. And I think here we could actually join forces because uh, uh, the schools and post offices are the hubs in many of the villages. So whatever happens in the village, people gather either in the schools, like in if it's elections or provision of the government services or in the post uh, 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 in or in the postal office. Uh, so we need to together work to connect all these villages to the internet. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, and of course, uh, the realities on the ground are very difficult. So sometimes uh, you have to go through very difficult, you know, mountainous terrain, 
um, or there is no electricity if you want to bring internet to the village or cables break and you uh, have to put you know local some inventions like plastic bottle of a broken cable so it doesn't break again or there is no transport so you still use horses uh, to deliver uh, goods back back and forth so we've been working a lot on pro connecting villages uh, to the internet and what we realized later and the speakers earlier mentioned that uh, and Paul said that it's not only about infrastructure it's about actually people's uh, human kind of aspects and skills so uh, and we've been working a lot on uh, increasing uh, digital literacy and skills of communities in rural areas so they would be able to take advantage of opportunities that digitaliz digitalization brings so uh, training them how to use uh, e-government services uh, actually training their government officials in local areas on e-government services so that then they can uh, become trainers uh, for the local communities e-commerce uh, so we have uh, entrepreneurs in villages who produce local goods, but they don't know how to uh, market them on the internet, and they don't know how to uh, use the existing systems to uh, lo the logistic supply chains to deliver their products and f uh, fintech uh, services too. Uh, so this was uh, kind of just a brief introduction to what we do and how we could uh, collaborate together, and probably during the discussion, I could share more of the uh, information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Talent. Um, this slide that you're on, don't, don't move it. I, li I like that, that, that. That's a really interesting um, way to end this. Uh, girls first, rural first, mobile first, local language first, and green first. And I think yeah, that's really important for our discussion so that we, we recognize here that there are um, quite a slew of underserved communities in this space um, that we need to serve. And again, this is something about inclusion. Digital inclusion is about including those who are not included. Simple as that. And to a large extent, the list you have here summarizes that quite nicely. We could add to this, of course, persons with disabilities. We could add to this of, um, you know, any number of groups. You know, don't, let's not target any one or group or the other. Um, so. One of the questions we need to get to now, I think, um, and I think Paul is going to, to jump in here. Um, how do we really drive this forward? Now that we've talked about some of these cases, how do you think we can drive this forward? What can countries do specifically to ensure that we improve connectivity in these communities? What can the post do? How can we utilize the post? to enable this. Um, you mentioned that the, sc the schools are doing it. Um, there's a project that I think I'm going to toss to Paul now that's called Connect Our Post, Paul mentioned earlier, that looks at this. There's some work going on right now, I believe, in the Caribbean um, regarding these areas, and I'll be spreading to other, other regions soon. So maybe, Paul, um, perhaps you could give us some insights on what the UPU is doing yeah. to make this happen. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Uh, uh, and um, I, I want to pick up on some of the points that have just been made by, by both Rodney and Talent because I think they're very uh, relevant for the discussion around digital inclusion and and just thinking about the the asset that exists in this uh, in the postal network and how it has been used in a number of countries. We have seen um, particularly the issue of, uh, of local language uh, that you mentioned, Talent, is a critical issue in these communities where we have this predominant or this dominance of English uh, on the internet uh, in a way that that excludes a lot of the people in the underserved communities. And uh, this is where um, governments have seen the benefit of the postal network. As I mentioned, there's 650,000 post offices. They are staffed by people. Those people are um, in contact with the local population and the local citizens and the local businesses every day in their local language. Uh, and we have examples uh, in all regions where um, the postal service has been a critical um, human um, hand um, to these uh, communities. Um, uh, in the area of e-commerce uh, that you mentioned, um, E-commerce is almost like the new Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, E-commerce is the, the 21st century Santa Claus because when people are online, they expect to have things delivered to them. 
um, uh, and they expect those things to be delivered relatively quickly. We have a lot of great examples uh, in postal delivery where uh, a postcard or a letter arrives one year later addressed to Paul in um, Bern, Switzerland. Uh, you know, there's, the, there's these great stories around how the post has been able to deliver um, mail in that way. But now in this world of e-commerce, that's not enough. Um, there needs to be a, a much more intelligent, digitally capable network than can support um, e-commerce deliveries as people expect them. Just like the children uh, expect Santa Claus to deliver off their Christmas list, we now expect uh, to have those um, e-commerce deliveries come to us. And also, businesses um, would like to participate from these communities, um, would like to participate. They are producing um, uh, local artefacts, for example, which uh, can be very popular. Uh, and can generate a lot of income which will bring sustainability to these communities. We talk about meaningful connectivity. We need to also bring sustainability into the meaningful connectivity discussion. Sustainability of the resource which is providing the connectivity and how that brings uh, sustainability of communities. And post offices um, uh, have uh, developed um, solutions in this area. Um, community access centres in Zimbabwe. Uh, are a good example where uh, in Zim, uh, Zim Post, uh, the Zimbabwe Postal Service, uh, is providing community access centres. They are providing digital connectivity. They are providing digital literacy services to these communities. So people can come to the post office uh, and other partners of the post who provide digital uh, literacy training, who provide digital capability training, are using the post office facility as a location for training the local community. So this complements the delivery of the connectivity to, to bring capacity building to these communities. Posts are obviously um, delivery partners, so they can deliver um, the mobile phones to these communities. They can work with governments to deliver affordable mobile phones, which is a, a, a critical policy issue in a number of countries where we heard yesterday in the uh, in the main hall, um, the issue of affordability of mobile devices or of uh, devices to connect to the internet. Um, again, the integration of post into to policy makers um, discussions uh, and into policies for digital inclusion can bring affordable delivery of these devices um, to those communities. It can also bring affordable delivery of connection points. Um, post offices can be Wi-Fi hubs, connectivity hubs in these communities. And again, in, uh, in the case of Zimbabwe, we have examples there of Zimpost uh, as community access centre providing local um, uh, network connectivity um, in that area. And also for SMEs, SMEs um, who want to be able to sell online, as Talant mentioned, um, the, this digital world provides them with that opportunity, but they lack the understanding they lack the skills on how to sell online. Uh, and so we have seen uh, examples in Asia uh, where uh, the post has partnered with eBay, for example. Um, and the post office has provided eBay training um, to local, local entrepreneurs um, who, who are making uh, these um, artifacts and making these um, goods that are interesting to sell online. So uh, on a Thursday afternoon at four o'clock, eBay comes to the post office. Uh, they organize a, a community uh, education and uh, train um, local entrepreneurs on how to be able to sell online. The post office is the hub for this information access, but it is also the gateway to um, exchange the goods uh, and also a lot of financial services. Financial services in the post is a, is a strong um, line of business. Uh, and uh, that's obviously important for e-commerce as well. So I think some of these issues uh, of access uh, and, and local um, language um, services from the post uh, are an important part of uh, helping the digital inclusion through the postal network. Thank you very much, Paul. And I just want to remind everyone this is an open forum. So once you are able to um, you know, gather your thoughts and uh, perhaps pose any comments, feedback, or questions, feel free to step to the mic, um, both online and um, on site in this room, and we will recognize you and, and take your feedback in. 
Um, so I'm going to wait, while we wait for any of that to come in, I'm going to now continue with um, our um, chat. So one of the things that, um, Paul, you just ended on this issue of local language. Um, in terms of indigenous groups, and so I'll kind of see if that, that uh, works with both of you, um, there has been a discussion around inclusion regarding their heritage, so the e-heritage, it's something called e-heritage, digital heritage. And there has been discussion in the past about whether or not these access centers, these telecenters can play a role there because in many cases they are, um, you know, they are in separate villages, separate communes in some cases, depending on how the state deals with the um, indigenous peoples. In some cases they're integrated. But there are very few case studies of where that has been able to be placed online, curated by the communities themselves and sustained over a period of time. There seems to be an opportunity here to utilize this, you know, the GDC as one of these um, vehicles for this. The posts coming in and saying, well, let's, let's play a role, some additional connectivity. Um, let's look at this as one of those potential inclusion topics. So I'm gonna ask perhaps Talent first, and then maybe Rodney, given his knowledge of the Caribbean and their indigenous uh, people's issues. But what do you think about that and how that can work? So Talent, perhaps you can go first. Thanks so much, Tracy. Uh, actually, this reminds me of two interesting uh, stories I wanted to share. One, uh, following up uh, Paul's uh, intervention, uh, when we connected the first community network in Kyrgyzstan, it's a village uh, in a mountainous area of uh, Susamur, the very first beneficiary of the internet was a local post office uh, officer. Because before the uh, internet connectivity, what he had to do is every week, at least once a week, he had to go to a, a nearby town, which was over the mountains, to, to check if there was mail for the villagers. He, he, could, he didn't have, there is no mobile connectivity, no internet, so he didn't know if there was any letters or packages or not, maybe passports for the local villagers. But in the winter, the road would be so treacherous that uh, it would take him maybe like you know, one day just to get to the town, and then he would spend the night, and the next day he would come back. And once the uh, internet appeared, he could at least find out, is there anything for me in the town uh, that makes me, uh, that I have to go and pick up? And actually this is a, uh, similar to the interesting cartoon that we watched when we were all uh, locked down during COVID with kids about Santa Claus. And there is this uh, young post officer who gets sent to Laplandia, very far away, and he has to go across the seas and mountains and forests just to find out if there is any message for him to deliver. Uh, and uh, another aspect uh, what he engaged in is to get more letters uh, to run through the post office so that he can get keep his job. He helped increase digital literacy in, of people in the village. So if we increase the e-commerce literacy of people, if we uh, provide uh, digital content in uh, local languages, that would mean that there will be much more information exchange happening. Uh, what we found out when we brought internet to the villages, the local community would say, thank you, but uh, there is nothing for me in there because I speak uh, my language and all the content in there is, uh, fo is foreign. So that's why we started as a second big uh, effort was to create uh, digital content, online content in Kyrgyz language. Plus, we found out that in these villages there were no uh, books for kids in Kyrgyz language. Uh, so one of the activities that we just recently did is to collect uh, 1,000 books for kids and we wanted to deliver them to many of the villages, but we couldn't do it physically. And of course, we turned to the uh, post office to help us deliver these uh, Christmas gifts almost. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, thank you. There, there are indigenous populations in, in the Caribbean. Um, I can think of uh, Dominica, Trinidad, Jamaica, uh, and so on. Um, and I think the, uh, I believe is UNESCO that has an initiative for digitizing some of these um, indigenous artifacts. Um, there is a market, I mean, globally for this kind of, this kind of information in particular, um, w these, these um, businesses that offer, um, the tracing of your heritage, right? Um, 
I think Ancestry.com and, and others like it. Uh, and I saw there's a move where, especially when you look at the historical, say for example, the transatlantic slave trade, where there's still a lot of information um, and there, where there's a diaspora in the United States and in the UK, um, people want to be able to trace their lineage. And I think, so that's an opportunity, I think, where um, there's an opportunity for the developing countries, those that have a rich history, those that have <coughs> indigenous populations, to monetize that content. Now, I, I would say that not enough is being done, and we run the risk of providing connectivity to people who are not connected now, and then there isn't the content that is relevant to them, um, or there isn't the, the values that that did that um, are that also relevant relevant to them. Um, there are a few initiatives in Barbados. I, they don't come to mind right now, but I'm um, happy to share them at another time where, again, it, the focus is on um, tracing ancestry and so on and, and um, documenting, say, the, the, um, the transatlantic slave trade and other, the, you know, the, the, the history of colonialism and so on so that people are aware of, of the cultural heritage and, and those sorts of um, historical artifacts that are of relevance today. Thanks. Thanks. And as I go to Paul, um, I want to add something to Paul's response to, the, to that question. So Paul, the, we spoke about government services and allowing the post offices to be you know, a one-stop shop in some way. Um, what in your experience have you seen in at the UPU with the post becoming that vehicle for including, and that's another version of inclusion now, including um, citizens who have been you know, not reached um, by the, the, the government service um, you know, footprint in terms of trying to get them to help them, not just with delivering the service itself, so delivering a passport and so on, but maybe even helping them actually apply for a service. Because uh, <coughs> again, as services go online, um, some people just don't know how, don't have a device as we spoke about. Um, maybe there's an opportunity there for that to happen as well. So if you have a response to the first part about indigenous, but we're not gonna switch that as well to the um, assistive aspect of um, inclusion. Paul? Yeah, Tracy, I, I think you bring up a, an important new point around um, uh, people's access to the digital world because um, uh, a lot of people uh, spi still find it difficult uh, to complete government um, forms online to be able to com com complete procedures for importing and exporting. And this is where the post office uh, has um, uh, provided services. So we know in Lebanon, for example, um, the Lebanon, um, uh, the government has, uh, has utilised the post in Lebanon uh, to support um, completion of online documents with offline verification. So you initiate the government transaction online um, through a portal which is um, hosted by uh, Liban Post, uh, which is the Lebanese Postal Service. And then uh, once you get to um, the submission of the document, you need to provide some physical proof of who you are um, uh, and and, and the, v the validity of the information provided. So you then come to the post office. You can schedule an appointment online so that you don't have to waste your time queuing for or traveling for a long period of time and then having to queue. So you can schedule an appointment. Uh, you can come and visit the post office, uh, verify the online information that you have provided, and then that completes the transaction. Uh, and so that's also uh, available for people who are not digitally literate. They can basically just initiate an appointment at the post office to say, I want to complete this government um, process. Uh, and then the postman or uh, woman um, in, the, in the post office will actually assist in, in completing that. Um, that process and that's a very important part that's not just in in Le Lebanon with Liban post in Kenya uh, with the Huduma um, project uh, which is a, a delivery of government services project uh, throughout the country um, then uh, Huduma centers uh, are established in post offices again there are in uh, in Kenya there are 55 government services that you can have access to through the post office in a variety of hybrid or online services um, and again, that supports the local language, uh, the local communities, and the digital, digital literacy um, issues in there. When we talk about um, going online, um, Tracy, I might actually give a bit of a segue into, in, into you introducing some, some ideas into the conversation. Then we talk about how 
um, the post can be a facilitator of businesses getting online. Um, uh, and, but to do that, we need to also empower the post with uh, this capability. And this is something at the UPU that we are uh, working very strongly on. Within the Connect.Post po project, we are advocating uh, with policymakers for them to be included into the digital plans. We're advocating for the connectivity of these post offices. But as um, uh, Rodney just mentioned, connectivity is not enough. There needs to be also this capability uh, within the post office. Uh, and so also when businesses go online, there needs to be this assurance of security. Um, when you're on the digital world, then there's a whole new um, set of um, skills that you need to make sure that you can survive in this digital world as well. So in the UPU, we are developing programs to support post offices in this capability build. Uh, and this is maybe something, Tracy, that you can talk to in terms of uh, the, the dot .post um, initiative uh, and its um, context within connect.post. Thank you for that segue, Paul. And I will share my screen just um, as, you've, as you have um, allowed me to, to, to do so. And I will show um, the audience what um, exactly what you're talking about in terms of um, the cybersecurity framework that the UPU has um, looked to build out. Um, let me just find a way to do this full screen um, and get this done. Hang on a sec. Um, I guess we don't need to instruct you, so... It's just a matter of finding the right pop button. Right, there we <laughs> are. So, I'm hoping you're seeing my screen now. No? Because it's sharing. It's loading, it's loading slowly. Is it loading? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, what you should be seeing is uh, a slide that refers to the SAP security framework. Let me just try again. Um, let me try. Oh, that's okay. So maybe I'll leave it there just to avoid any any challenges and try and give you a view. Um, what are you seeing? The screen. All right, great. Okay, great. So I think I could I could use this. Um, just get a little bigger, maybe. No, it's fine. Okay, let's let's use this. So, to a large extent, this screen um, attempts to show the overall UPU cybersecurity policy framework, um, which is based around. Um, what Paul mentioned as the dot .post environment. Um, we have a platform, um, which I'm um, currently in charge of, that looks to roll out for the posts a secure, trusted environment where you can deliver services um, utilizing a secure top-level domain, the dot .post TLD, but also a series of um, accompanying policy frameworks, services, and wrappers around that. So. We start with the security framework, as you can see here. Not want to get too technical, but rest assured, complying to this framework allows posts, and anyone actually for that matter, to deliver services that are, that are reasonably secure um, in terms of getting it at a basic level. We're not securing it at a network level, we're doing it at the, the DNS level here, and looking to secure email as well. So we're utilizing standards that are well known to um, the IT folks in, in your organization, SPF, DKIM, DMARC, um, and also dot .post is DNSSEC um, compliant. We secure the root. And not only that, we have um, a framework where we can allow you to track your compliance using something called cybertrack.post. So once you are part of the dot .post environment, you're able to track your compliance um, on a dashboard that we are able to offer to you. Um, you'll get alerts. You'll be able to, to ensure that um, on, a, on, a, on a rolling basis, daily, otherwise, uh, whether you're complying with all of our policy frameworks and how we, we approach that. And as we move forward in terms of what we're going to do um, next, um, we have a learning platform where you can build capacity, as we talked about that earlier. One of the aspects of this inclusion is building capacity around cybersecurity, digital, e-commerce, and so on. So we have built out a learning platform for that to happen. And we are also about to launch um, a secure um, dot .post portal. What that is going to do is allow the post to come in and access partner material from a series of international partners, provides material already, 
you can put it in one location so that the postal network can get in and access uh, material that is already available in terms of training, um, infographics, um, best practices, policies, and so on. And that's coming soon. Uh, we should have that up and running in Q4 of 2023, and that will be available. It will be open to all, but um, really designed for the postal sector. Not only that, at the UPU, we've built out a CERT uh, for the postal sector um, that is um, currently being deployed, and that CERT will allow us to respond to incident, um, uh, incidents within the postal sector that can be then shared as a best practice, depending on what's happening there, with other members of the sector. And that will eventually lead to something called an ISAC, which we are currently implementing um, an information sharing and an analysis center for the entire global postal sector, the regulated sector. So that's coming soon from Dot Post. And not only that, uh, just to, to, um, to share with you what's really coming, um, and, and you visit our booth in the IGF to, to learn more, we are going to be offering um, secure services on our new platform, our Dot Post registration platform. On this platform, you'll be able to get um, secure DNS services, secure websites, secure hosting. This is important because, as we mentioned earlier, posts are looking to, to move forward with e-commerce, marketplaces, and so on. But the skill sets and the capacities that they have within the post are very limited. I, I've been to a few posts, and I've seen that you know sometimes there's one IT person working there, covering everything, from the PCs on the desk of the, the, the workers to the network, to trying to get um, just stuff done you know, on a day-to-day basi -day basis. So having a, uh, something as esoteric as an e-commerce platform and building it out and doing all the work required is very challenging. So we plan to offer, the, at the very least, the infrastructure to allow it to happen at a reasonable price, um, utilizing our secure platform, so that they can obtain these services and deploy them very rapidly, so very quick to deploy. And to do that, we are going to offer them um, as you said, secure DNS, certificates, secure email, secure web hosting, and eventually, once um, they, they get all of that right, secure e-commerce, pay payment platforms and connections to tools like Stripe um, and the traditional payment services that you might have in your country, whether it be wal wallets or otherwise. So Paul, I think that's a, thank you for that segue and allow me to, to do this. Sorry if I'm not able to do full screen. But certainly you can contact us afterwards to get a, a demonstration of what we can offer. Or you can visit us at our booth in the IGF Village today. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, well done, Tracy. And, and uh, these important new services are really going to help empower the postal network to, to deliver the types of um, services that we've been discussing. But um, just to, to, to reinforce that actually these services are actually being used already in a number of countries. So in Zimbabwe, uh, I think Tracy, um, Zimbabwe Mall.post is uh, a national marketplace um, that Zimbabwe Post is hosting for the SMEs in Zimbabwe. Um, there are, uh, I believe, over 300 SMEs that have registered on Zimbabwe Mall, uh, and they are selling their goods online um, using the, 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 the platform that uh, Zimbabwe Post, or Zimpost as they're called, uh, are providing. Um, and this is an example of um, how posts are supporting um, the SME's inclusion in the digital economy uh, with e-commerce support services. Um, they are also providing payment support services. So this is one of the critical issues in e-commerce. Um, the availability of payment support in many countries for e-commerce is a challenge. Credit cards are not readily available. Um, so from a financial inclusion perspective, um, the Post is an important partner in, in helping businesses um, to get online and get access to sustainable um, services. So this is a, a sustainability issue, utilising this public infrastructure to support say, sustainability of digital inclusion. Um, uh, we also have another example in Rwanda um, with Rwanda Mall. Um, Rwanda Mall is a national marketplace. Uh, again, there are uh, over 500 um, SMEs that are registered in Rwanda Mall um, uh, as a national marketplace to, to be able to sell online. 
um, but the government found that the majority of those SMEs are located in the capital city that are registered. Uh, and so there is a push now through the postal network uh, to reach out to the rural areas where many SMEs do exist um, and, and to encourage those SMEs to come online with the support of the, of the post office network. And this national marketplace uh, is a very important concept uh, for the policymakers because it encourages um, exports, uh, it encourages um, uh, economic development in these communities. Uh, and uh, the post as the support service with uh, excellent technical um, solutions that Tracy's um, talking about gives the security and trust um, for these marketplaces to exist in the, in the national environment uh, and to encourage SMEs to be able to, to participate online um, uh, and also provide them with the necessary training and support. And, and I know with, uh, with Rodney, uh, we're working uh, closely between the UPU and the CTU uh, on bringing this capability to the, the small island developing states in, in the Caribbean. Uh, we've recently signed a, a cooperation agreement, so we're very proud to be, to be working with the CTU uh, and uh, bringing this capability to the, the Caribbean uh, postal um, services uh, and also collaborating uh, with the integration of this within government policy uh, across the Caribbean. Um, and and you know, I think this is going to be very important for the development of the, the, the economies in the Caribbean, Rodney. Yeah, certainly. So I think, Rodney, uh, what, what we could segue into there is uh, using the MOU um, that we signed with, with the CTU as a jumping off point um, and having seen what the, the first, we've actually done one, um, project under that in Barbados already. Uh, having seen what's, what's happened there, what do you think are the real opportunities that exist now for post to, to really offer this digital inclusion vehicle, um, additional services? Is there an opportunity for maybe collective action, working together as a region, um, revenue opportunities, new revenue opportunities uh, in this area, as well as potentially, um, from from where you sit, um, trying to, you know, truly bring the postal network into national digital policy, and ensure that they can almost provide the the digital inclusion solution, if not all of it, part of it. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, there are definitely opportunities um, for revenue. The the examples I mentioned before brought significant revenues to the. Postal, Barbados Postal Service. So each delivery was the cost. A nominal cost, mind you, it was like $10, which is five, five US dollars for um, delivery. But compare that to, you know, like I said, the cost of, of, of getting public transportation or even driving your car, the time off from work and that kind of thing. Um, and so m the majority of persons opted to choose that delivery service. There's still some awareness that has to, ha has to happen at the level of pos policy makers who aren't really yet of that mindset who don't fully understand the nexus between digital and postal. So um, there's still the notion that you know everything can be done online. <laughs> but, but the reality is that online has to connect at some point with the offline and therefore that collaboration is critical. So there's need for awareness. The collaboration uh, we have, I mean, there's, uh, Paul is participating in our upcoming ICT week and has an opportunity to present this at the regional level. Um, so that we are on the same page, um, but the regional notwithstanding, we will we will work as it were from door to door. So we will work with a coalition of the willing. The, we've had expressions of interest from the likes of Belize, even though it's a, it's 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 not an island, but it is classified as one of our CARICOM states. And I, I think actually you enlist it as a SIDS for some reason, but. <laughs> But um, Belize, the dynamic in Belize is very different. Belize is the same population as Barbados, but it's spread throughout a much, much uh, bigger land, land mass. And therefore, this is something that they're very, very keen on. And uh, imagine, you know, I talk about taking time off from Barbados, but the truth is you can get from one end of Barbados to the next in about half an hour, 45 minutes, depends how fast you're driving. But with Belize, you can travel for four hours, you know, from one town to the next. So, and therefore, uh, it becomes even more important when you have that sort of geographic um, spread of, of towns and villages to be able to connect with the post. So there's some awareness that has to be done. I've seen where there are revenue opportunities um, for the post. I've seen where 
The postal workers themselves get excited about being included in this new digital transformation. Um, and um, they, uh, the citizens who, who interact with them, um, because again, they're friendly faces, they're, they're pleased to see um, the people that they know um, helping in, in terms of delivering those public services. So I don't remember the figure, but there was significant revenue that was earned by the post, um, I think. But I would say that we, we talked about um, fulfillment centers and so on uh, and, and, and so on. The infrastructure point of view, uh, is there's a need to Im Im ensure that they are they have positioned themselves. In other words, that there's whatever renovations they need to do, that the facility is there when it comes. When if they have to go to the post, there's a space for it. And Jamaica has done this successfully. Um, Jamaica, one of the largest post offices in the, in the heart of Kingston, um, has been transformed. It's been fully modernized. And it's actually the place where you go to apply. Uh, if, you, if you don't apply online, you can go and there and apply for your digital identity and have it have it delivered there to you. I know Jamaica's has some challenges with it, but the fact is they're working with the post office on that particular initiative, um, and they have completely renovated the postal so post office and have made it sort of e-commerce ready and as a fulfillment center. Thanks. And talent. Thanks, Rodney. The nexus now between the business side of um, the post and let's get perhaps what your thoughts on whether or not inclusion at a community level from the com business side can also extend into the community side and when I say that when you are talking about content generation we, we brought, brought that topic earlier and having that as a potential revenue opportunity you know so there's let there be very little um, content from the Central Asia region online. And having your stakeholders learn, consume, and perhaps even earn revenue, write books on, you know, sell books online, sell research articles, do research. Um, do you see that as being something that can happen um, with the post? And if so, how can community networks um, assist in that regard and, and getting community networks as a as a sort of a, a catalyst f to make that something like that happen. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Tracy, for a very good question. Actually, I'm learning a lot uh, from today's discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly when I'm back home, I will share with my colleagues in the postal service. Uh, and at the same time, I know that Kyrgyz uh, Postal Service has been uh, looking into different opportunities that uh, uh, digitalization is bringing, uh, including uh, in terms of e-commerce, it also reminded me that uh, in Kyrgyzstan, where still postal service is still looking into uh, providing banking services, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Japan is one of the successful cases here, where postal service um, provides, uh, or one of the biggest financial services uh, institutions. And uh, uh, there is one maybe story that uh, for Paul's collection of stories <laughs> uh, about Kyrgyzstan, how postal service uh, was, uh, you know, instrumental in uh, involving uh, people providing government services. So um, Kyrgyzstan is considered a, uh, one of the more democratic countries in in, uh, in the region of Central Asia, and uh, our previous president decided that we should have elections uh, based on. Um, uh, e uh, biometrical data so that uh, and using uh, electronic polling machines uh, but of course not everybody had uh, biometric da data in the system and not everybody had digital IDs and the postal offices became the hubs to uh, help people uh, uh, get all that uh, data and uh, and it had to be done within just a, I think maybe a couple of months Everybody, if you wanted to participate in the elections, you need to register through the system. And uh, uh, grandmas, grandparents, young uh, people, everybody would go to the post office and get services in local languages or like step-by-step uh, -step kind of guidance in, in doing this. And as a result, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we had elections which were unprecedented. I mean. Uh, for the past 20 years, every elections we would have uh, protest the following day. 
because there were so many opposition parties pr uh, contesting. When we did this uh, new approach, the following day it was so quiet. And for Kyrgyzstan, it's unusual to have a quiet day after the election because everybody trusted uh, the system. Uh, and maybe the, not everybody knew about the uh, cybersecurity threats. So this is coming back to your <laughs> presentation. And those who kind of uh, are more into digitalization, they were concerned. Now I've submitted by my biometric data to the government, to the postal service. But is it safe? We don't know. I hope it's safe. But for sure, we need to follow up on, on your presentation and to ensure and double ensure that all the data is, uh, is actually secure and safe. Maybe if I can um, just follow up on that uh, talent, then um, those issues uh, face, uh, are faced in many countries uh, and, and even in the advanced countries where we think that, uh, that um, everything is well established, uh, even the role of the post in supporting advanced countries in this area is uh, still evident. Um, uh, I'm thinking of Switzerland. Uh, so this year, um, Switzerland will hold electronic voting uh, and Swiss Post is actually uh, one of the providing um, agencies to support the electronic voting system in Switzerland um, for elections. So uh, in, in Switzerland, um, they've taken that one step further as actually the, the Post is supporting the e-voting system uh, itself wi within the, the, the country. But Talon, I, I think I, I want to take a, another angle uh, with you as well in terms of the... Um, um, ISOC's activities, uh, and I know that you're active in community networks and the deployment of community networks, uh, and I wonder if you see out of this discussion today, if you see a, a role that the Post could play in the deployment of community networks, um, even maybe to the extent of um, co-location of infrastructure in postal facilities, um, <coughs> uh, the logistics uh, to get equipment, uh, distributed into to community centres. I wonder if you've got some some ideas or uh, some some feedback on on that sort of concept. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for sure. Uh, there are already uh, several thoughts that I uh, I have uh, uh, that uh, could be done together uh, with the post office, uh, starting with uh, uh, the physical infrastructure and network of postal uh, services across the country, uh, and. Uh, Rodney mentioned about you know, fulfillment centers. I think uh, uh, the postal offices in Kyrgyzstan are already trying uh, to um, become kind of, uh, if not leaders, but active participants of this uh, uh, system, uh, providing uh, digital skills trainings. For example, when we go to remote locations, uh, oftentimes there are no um, official or government uh, buildings or uh, kind of suitable offices where you can have a uh, training. Uh, and if you have a place, uh, oftentimes you don't have uh, workers who are uh, who could provide this kind of trainings because villagers are usually, you know, they're tending their uh, animals or are in the fields. And usually, postal workers and municipal workers are the kind of front lines of people who local communities are actually expect. Uh, when nationally there is a new service, they would come and ask the postal service officers and uh, municipal service officers like teach us what's going on in the center and I think uh, the um, postal offices could be like in the in the avant-garde in terms of providing these trainings and for us when we work on these kinds of activities we are we feel very short-handed because we don't have the uh, network of facilities and network of people like the postal service does so I think there is th there could be a lot of col collaboration in that Thanks very much, Talent. Oh, I think we, um, we have some intervention from the floor. Um, you could state your name and... Sure. Bevel Wooding. Uh, in this case, i uh, be representing the Caribbean Network Operators Group, a volunteer-based group of uh, computer and network engineers who have been looking at ways to offer and support um, digital, digital solutions throughout the Caribbean. I'm listening to the, the presentation that, that Tracy gave and I'm very impressed with the initiatives that are coming out and just wondered if there was a way for us to support that within the context of the Caribbean. We have been working with the, very closely with the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Uh, we have everything from uh, digital training and literacy uh, type programs that I think would do, would do very well if they were aligned to initiatives like this, uh, which will help with postal um, improvement, which is tied to 
the digital economy. So is there is there opportunity for collaboration, support, um, working alongside um, where those volunteers that we have would be very keen to help support at the national and regional level would be able to join something like this and, um, and help accelerate the deployment? Thank you, um, Bevel. Um, so we'll address that question after I said that's, that's another, you have a question now? Yes, maybe take this one as well. Thank you yeah. very much for the presentations, which are very exciting and enlightening. I'm Christine Mujimba. I work with the regulator in Uganda, who also oversees the postal uh, sector. And so um, hearing all this, I was actually pleasantly surprised of the opportunities in comparison to what is happening on ground in terms of the readiness of our national post, uh, post operator to actually leverage these opportunities. So my question is, um, from your experience, what are the key critical success factors, especially from a policy perspective, to position the postal network to actually take on those opportunities? Um, because the current status is more on some post offices closing, issues of sustainability, the balance between the obligations for universal service vis-a-vis uh, -vis also competition from other courier companies that have come in and gone into the logistic market. So we have, for example, like uh, how you'd have Uber here going into deliveries and things like that. So I'm interested in, in um, knowing uh, the experience of, especially from a policy perspective, what can be done to reposition uh, what is seemingly like dying to the point of uh, um, the gentleman from Caribbean, like something that got stuck in couldn't compete with email and has been overtaken, and yet there's so much opportunity from what I'm hearing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your question as well. So I think we will start with answering the Revel Woodings question. So we'll toss to Rodney yeah. and maybe Paul, you can take the, the, it's above my pay grade, so you can take the other one. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, um, just by way of example, and yes, we do work with Caribnog, but just to draw the example of the support we provided to the Caribbean Postal Union, where the website was down, is a very resource constrained organization. Um, and we noticing that the website was down, reached out to them and helped them register a .post domain um, using Richard from my office, just for that basic level of support. And um, I suspect as they struggle, a lot of the other um, territories will struggle. You mentioned there's one IT guy who's doing everything. <laughs> um, so even um, by way of, of, first of all, um, bringing together the technical community to work with Tracy to understand what the dot post initiative is all about, what are the technical requirements, and then supporting. Um, not you know, be up there are a lot of young people in Carbnog as well, and maybe we can we can leverage them. We wouldn't be able to afford say someone of Niall's caliber. Um, <coughs> you know, he's a <laughs> he's an international resource, but you may can use some of the young people to help. Um, just sort of basic support to uh, help the post offices get, get off the ground. And I saw these, if you go to cpu.post, you'll see um, how we were able to support the postal union. And I see the need for that kind of support going forward. But of course, is I think it would be useful for the next Carbnog to have a presentation from you and, and work with the engineers, if it hasn't been done yet, to, to get a better understanding um, of what is required. Thank you very much, um, SG Taylor. So um, I think that's, that's a very good, that's sold. Let's make that happen. <laughs> um, to answer the, the question from the um, um, Uganda regulator, Paul, maybe you could take that. As I said, I think it's above my pay grade. So maybe you can take yeah, that. Yeah, happy. <coughs> Excuse me. Happy to, Tracy. Uh, but also, I'd just like to respond to Neville's question as well, because I think that um, the post um, is there to support um, the national um, skills that are available in a variety of different sectors. Uh, and so if there can also be this partnership with the post office, um, it can help support um, local expertise that's available in the, the young, um, 
also with universities, um, uh, with uh, local associations. Um, these, um, these resources uh, are there to work with the post office. So the post office would love to reach out into these communities, gain access to these skills and use those to, to share with, first of all, postal employees. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, one of the things that has to happen is actually education of postal employees around the digital capability, uh, what is possible and how it is possible. Um, which is uh, the second most important thing. So working with these local associations, I think, is an excellent idea. Um, and it's something that we have seen being done in other parts of the world. Um, so uh, I would very much support that within the, the Caribbean, and, and we can continue that discussion, uh, Rodney, uh, under our collaboration. Let me come to the second question from Christine. Thank you very much uh, for what is a very interesting question. Um, uh, and the key challenges uh, that we see in this uh, are to do with um, awareness um, and, and to do with, Rodney mentioned this before, about the change in mindset about what this public infrastructure is possibly able to deliver in terms of the government's goals. Um, and that's where we are working very closely together. Uh, the UPU has this program, Connect.Post, which is discussing the new use of the postal network um, as a means for governments to achieve sustainable development goals, economic development, uh, and digital development. Uh, and so our role is to advocate for this change to happen. Uh, and as Rodney mentioned, uh, policymakers in some ways are, are not aware. They're thinking of, uh, as you mentioned, Christine, the old role of the post in delivering letters. Um, and letters uh, are not a significant part of the economy, particularly in your region, for example. Um, E-commerce is where the activity is and the competition that you mentioned is happening. Um, uh, and so as a regulator, you are seeing the development of the e-commerce logistics uh, space um, in uh, effectively in competition with the post office. But the post office is really about universal service for letters. Now, there needs to be a change in mindset about what is universal service. What does the community need in this new age of e-commerce? The community needs quality, reliable um, logistics delivery services. Coming back to the Santa Claus analogy at the beginning of this uh, from Talent, people expect now quality delivery. And uh, many of these competitors that, um, that you refer to in your market are mainly focused on the urban areas because that's where the, the issue is. So universal access to e-commerce is, uh, is a point across the whole of uh, Uganda. Uh, so the rural communities in Uganda should have the same right to e-commerce access as the people who are living in the, the urban areas. And so this is a, a new dialogue that we are encouraging. Now it's a two-way dialogue. The governments are not really aware um, of this new um, value that the, the public network, the public postal network can bring, but also it's a responsibility of the post to advocate for this new role with the policymakers as well. So it's a two-way discussion. Um, uh, we've seen very um, uh, good examples. I've mentioned Zimbabwe. It's been a discussion between the, the government and the postal operator with the regulator involved as well about how the public postal infrastructure can deliver on government's goals and uh, be an implementation arm for government policy, particularly e-commerce strategy, um, digital um, transformation strategy. We've seen in Ghana, um, where Ghana has been recognised in the new um, digital strategy for Ghana. The, the, the post office in Ghana has been recognised as an implementation partner to bring the inclusion um, elements that we've discussed on this panel today. It requires um, uh, a new thought process. Uh, and we see with uh, now the next generation coming into the policy making environment, the next generation coming into the leadership of the post, then they are educated in the possibilities of the digital economy and they are as more excited than we are about the opportunities for true inclusion across the whole country. And this is the really important issue that the public postal network provides. It is an inclusion vehicle for social inclusion, for digital inclusion, for financial inclusion. 
um, uh, and Talant mentioned um, uh, the example of Japan Post. Uh, the, cha the Japan Postal Savings Bank uh, was one of the largest banks in the world, uh, in fact. Um, uh, and, and that's a traditional role for postal savings. Uh, that's a traditional role. As children, you were given access to a postal savings account and it was your um, uh, pocket money that you were saving in a postal savings bank account. Uh, and that's a traditional role in many, many countries. Um, but there have been posts that have recently entered the banking services. Uh, and it's a, a trend that we see in a number of posts. Uh, uh, India Post has 155,000 post offices across every community in India. And they are banking the unbanked. Um, they are providing postal savings banks. They are providing financial services to all in India, in all 155,000 post offices. The Indian government has seen the benefit of connecting these post offices. So they have connected, all of the Indian post offices are connected um, with, uh, with available connectivity to support banking services, postal services, e-commerce services. So, yeah, the critical success factors you asked uh, from a policy perspective are, first of all, to be aware of the new role that this public infrastructure can play in achieving government goals. Uh, we advocate for it to be integrated, the postal network to be integrated into digital strategies, into e-commerce strategies. So we're working with UNCTAD, uh, for example, as part of the E-Trade for All initiative, um, where we are doing uh, assessments across the world with the government, with the ministry, on e-commerce development. And we're uh, integrating the post in e-commerce strategies and e-commerce policies and action plans for the development of e-commerce. We were working with uh, the CTU in the Caribbean uh, along the same lines as well of integrating the post into to digital um, capability um, uh, development with policy makers and, and regulators. Um, and the sustainability of this public infrastructure is a critical issue for the policy makers. As you mentioned, the, the letters revenue is dying. So diversification of services to help the sustainability of this public infrastructure is a vital thing. And the diversification of services is not about exclusivity. It's about partnering with banks. It's about partnering with e-commerce companies. It's about a public-private partnership between this public infrastructure and the private sector services uh, capability um, and, and to use the postal network as a vehicle to reach all of the population. The private sector has the solutions, but they don't have access to the market. The post office has access to the market, but doesn't have solutions. So the partnership between the public sector and the private sector is an important policy issue um, that uh, post offices, regulators and policy makers should be uh, considering in terms of sustainability and economic development and diversification. So. It was a very long answer, I'm sorry, but hopefully it addresses the, the points that you, that you asked, Christine. Yeah, thanks, but I think it's a very comprehensive answer. It's also your last word, because we have just less than two minutes left, so I'm going to ask my colleagues on the panel to wrap up in about a minute. So here's the wrap up. This also helps with our reporting. Give me one key takeaway and one call to action that you'd like to, to, to make in regards to the postal network being a vehicle for digital inclusion, given your experiences? So I, I would say the call to action at the level of policymakers is to push for greater awareness um, uh, across CARICOM. So we are working with one or two, and we can should continue to push so that we have proof of concept. But we should also embark on a very heavily on an awareness campaign so that we have more collective action within the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Um, talent, one takeaway? One call to action. Uh, well, I think uh, clearly there are so many opportunities that uh, postal services, uh, especially in Kyrgyzstan, could uh, take advantage of. And of course, it will uh, depend a lot on learning from the global experience and being agile and nimble on the, on the national level. All right, and since you were so short and brief, I could ask Paul maybe to give us one takeaway and one call to action. 
Yeah, thanks, Tracy. So I think the, the, the key takeaway that I bring is that there um, uh, is an interest in exploring the use of this public uh, infrastructure for digital inclusion. That's clear from our discussions today. Um, there is a, a call to action to the, the governments to um, reflect on their commitments that they made 20 years ago at WISIS about ensuring that, um, that post offices, libraries and schools, as you mentioned before, um, were key implementation agents for um, connectivity and digital inclusion. That's still as relevant today as it was 20 years ago. Uh, and the call to action is for, for governments and policymakers to meet their commitments that were made 20 years ago. Thank you very much. And I would like to give my own f final call to action. Do it, but do it safely and do it securely. Come to us for advice on that and we can help you with that. With that, I'd like to end this discussion. Thank you so much for your uh, participation, for your engagement, for the great knowledge shared. Um, this recording will be available online on the Internet Governance Forum YouTube channel. So if you missed anything, feel free to review it. Thank you once again. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the IGF. Enjoy Kyoto. Konnichiwa. Uh, and before leaving, Arigato. Taste the chocolate, please. <laughs> Everybody deserved a little bit of it. Chocolate for free. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>